okay, good to, good to know. Okay, so this is joint work with Sriram Krishnamurthy, who's also at, at Brown University. And I'm gonna start by asking you to all work on a small programming problem, okay? So get your pencil, paper, napkin, whatever you need. Here's your task. I want you to write or sketch out a program that takes a list or an array, whichever you prefer, of numbers, and produces the average of the non-negative numbers that occur before minus 999, which may or may not be in the list. If it's not there, you're just gonna do the whole list. Don't think about IO, okay? Just take the list or array as input. Use any language or language subset you want. We're just curious to see how the people in this room think of this problem. So I'll give you a minute to, to kind of plan out your solution to this. Okay, hang on to your thought of what you came up with. I'm gonna come back to you in a couple of slides and ask what everybody, what everybody here did. And what this problem is and why I'm giving it to you, it's a problem known as rainfall. And rainfall has been studied in the computing education literature for quite some time. It was first proposed in the mid-1980s by Elliot, Sol Elliot Soloway at Yale. And he wanted to see, you know, obviously this is an easy problem, right? It's the kind of thing everybody coming out of an intro CS course should be able to do. He gave it to his freshmen at Yale, and over 75% of them got it wrong. Now, you may have thoughts on Yale, you know, depending on where you went to school, but I don't think that's actually what's going on here. Rainfall, this was such an interesting finding that people have tried to replicate it over the years. So 10 years later, so 1994, another professor gives it in his class of 80 students, and he was doing one of these multi-paradigm introductions to programming. So he gave his students the task in four different languages, 20 students in each of four languages. So they did Lisp and Fortran or, or whatever, and 71% of his students had more than three errors. Errors in this case could mean anything from forgetting to update a variable when you were counting, to flipping the greater than equal sign, forgetting you might divide by zero. There's a lot of different notions of errors, but there's an average of four to six errors per student in what should be a three-line program, right? So there's clearly something going on here that we're not happy about. And even as recently as 2013, an instructor in Australia gives this to his C++-based intro class, and well, okay, 36% of them had nothing relevant. At least half of them realized they needed a loop. That must be progress. Um, but only 21% of them figured out how to count the values in the loop. This should not be this hard of a problem, right? And yet somehow it is. And if you look at the, the leading blog on computing education, it's written by a professor at Georgia Tech named Mark Guzdial. And in 2010, he put out a, a challenge to those in the computing ed research community which says, after 30 years, why is this problem not done? Why haven't we beaten the rainfall problem? Have we really made this little progress in teaching CS that this is still an issue? And he goes on later on to say, the teach scheme approach focuses on design driven by data. I bet their students could beat rainfall. So if you're not familiar with teach scheme, it's now called program by design. This was a program that started 20, 25 years ago out of Rice University, teaching a data type driven approach to programming starting in Racket. Okay, so this is a curriculum that was deployed nationally. I was part of the group that uh, was deploying this curriculum. And so students were learning Racket in a very step-by-step -step process for approaching problems over recursively defined data. So I had gone down to visit Mark separately a couple of years after this, and he said, you know, all these studies of the rainfall problem, nobody has ever looked at what happens with students who've learned functional programming. You know functional programming, why don't you see what your students do with this problem? And from that has come several years of research and ultimately this, this talk. So the perspective that I'm coming from here, I'm a kind of, I was raised as a functional programmer for all intents and purposes. I mean, a brief intro on Pascal and then we got past that. But I think in Racket, um, I am teaching my first course with Scala right now for students who started in Racket and OCaml, then went into Java, and now we're back in Scala. Oh, and the sigh of relief when they saw they had pattern matching again was just, it was worth a photo, photo op. Um, and I've been teaching intro computer science now for 20 odd years with functional being the first course and then teaching OO in Java as students follow up from functional. So that's kind of the context 
that I come from in, in working on this problem. And I've left plenty of time in this talk for questions, so feel free to interrupt me as we go. Um, this, is, this is meant to be interactive and, and get you thinking about the lives of 18-year-olds. Of OK, <laughs> so let's come back to this rainfall problem. How can this possibly be difficult? Well, it looks easy to us because we're experienced programmers. But if you really pull this apart, there's six different subtasks in this problem that you're being asked to solve. You have to take input and truncate it at this sentinel, this minus 999, which may or may not show up. You have to ignore negative numbers, sum data, count data, compute an average, and you have to handle empty data or the division by zero case. Okay? So there's actually six separate subtasks buried in this problem. And this is where it starts to get challenging. Okay? Because somebody who's going to write code for this, whether they realize it or not, they have to weave together constructs for these six, cons these six different tasks individually and make them work as a cohesive program. In essence, that's what the research finds is, is tough for students about this. So now when I got the challenge to do this functionally, here's the experiment we set up. We got four schools that were using this how to design programs curriculum. Five different courses were involved in this study. So two of them were conventional introductory CS courses for freshmen who may or may not choose to major in computer science. One was an accelerated course for students who had had computer science in high school and were now in their first college course. One was a course for non-majors. And one was a high school course. They were all using the same textbook. They were all using functional programming, but they were in different functional languages depending on the instructor. Okay? They were either using Racket, OCaml, or Pirate, which is a functional language that's been developed by our group at, at Brown, which I could talk about offline if anybody's interested. None of these courses had taught read, print, I.O., and none of these courses had taught state. Everybody was in a pure functional mindset at the point that they did this exercise. Okay. All right, now we're back to your solutions to this. I am going to put up three high-level structures of solutions. Okay. I want you to see if what you came up with fits any of these, and then we're going to show hands and see where we landed. All right, top left, the single loop solution, as the name suggests, does one iteration over the input data. So you're going to loop until you hit that sentinel. You'll check for the non-negatives as you hit each value. And you'll maintain sum and counts, whether you do them in variables or additional parameters. The point is you're going to do one traversal over the data after which you compute the average. Okay, that's single loop. Lower left, clean first. You do a pre-loop to chop off the data at the sentinel and throw away the negatives. So you're just left with the, the list or array of numbers that you want to do the average over. And then you separately do the average however you choose to do that computation, but it's at least a two-loop solution with the first one cleaning. Third solution on the right, cleaning multiple times. So you have one iteration or one loop that handles counting and cleaning together. You have a separate loop over the original data that does cleaning and summing, and then you do the average. OK, how many of you came up with single loop versions? OK, about half. How many did clean first? OK, how many did clean multiple? OK, anybody do something completely different? Take yeah, take while, filter. OK, <laughs> clearly I am in an audience that gets FP. It's nice to be home. Um, <laughs> usually I give this talk, and it's 90% of the room, maybe 98% says single loop, and the rest of them are scratching their heads saying, why would you write this the other way? Sadly, this is often in computer science education offices, uh, conferences, but that's another, another issue. Yes? So you mentioned that uh, students learn like, uh, functional programming, but what you see here is like, looks like imperative. So what, exact, what construct do they use in, in these languages? OK, so just to get it on camera, the, the question was, we say that we're starting in functional programming, but these look like imperative loops. So what are students using? I was trying to be language agnostic in a sense and make this about the traversals and what they did. And this syntax simply reads better to general audiences than functional syntaxes. So a student who's in a functional context 
might implement that single loop and with a single recursive function that has additional parameters for sum and count. Right? So these can be either regular looping constructs or recursive functions, depending on your taste. Any other questions? Yes. Sure, that also comes in. That's not something we're usually talking about in a first programming course, but yes, that is also, or at least not my first programming courses. It would affect runtime, and we will hit runtime. Yes. Would you consider the take while filter and then the actual operation to be the clean first? I would put that in the clean first, yeah. Whether you do that in one operation or two, the point is you're cleaning out and then working with clean data, right? Okay, now, historically, what does the data look like? If you take the various papers that have been published on rainfall over time and look at these solutions and what students write, here's what we get. 70 odd percent write a single loop, 30 odd percent get nowhere. Okay, this is the typical kind of result that you, you get. Now, to be fair, a lot of the papers in which this study was first done this was starting to be taught in the mid 80s when people were not teaching students data structures in CS1. Maybe they saw arrays late in the course, okay? But they certainly didn't have any kind of intermediate data structure as a pattern. So if you don't have the ability to store intermediate data, in some sense a single traversal is your only option. So this data is gonna be somewhat influenced or these trends are gonna be influenced by what people were teaching at the time. Yes? For the ones who don't get anywhere, how long are they usually getting solved? So this varies from study to study, but it's often anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. So it's enough time that they should have gotten somewhere. Okay. Yes. Okay, so now, my data with the study we did with functional programmers, there's their distribution. Okay, so the most common solution was the cleaning first. Um, in our case, they were not doing the take while because we were in racket, which didn't have take while, but it was the same, the same idea. We had several who did clean multiple. Then we had single loop. Uh, single loop is obviously a bit smaller, and it's the least popular of the three that get somewhere. We have a handful who just skipped the cleaning and wrote average. And then, you know, the Captain Kirk approach, right? Change the problem, make it simpler. Um, <laughs> and then we still have a bunch who don't get anywhere and don't get a, a plan out of this. But what's interesting is that the students in the study I did who had a clear structure, one of those three left bars, very, very few errors. Using the same error categories we had found in the earlier studies, our students were averaging 0.7 errors per student as opposed to somewhere between four to six. Okay, so there's a big difference going on here. Um, and this was because we were in a language that let students approach this the first way, this was actually the first study on this that explored multiple structures to the problem. Nobody even bothered reporting on this metric earlier because everybody knew you were writing a single loop. That's how you solve the problem, right? So it's, it's already interesting. Now, sometimes I, I give this talk to people who, who appreciate functional programming. They start cheering. They say, yeah, functional programming rocks. It wins. Not quite. If you're having that thought, hold it. We, we got more to talk about, it's not just a language result, but it says that something interesting is happening. Let's dig in to the students who had clear composition structures, these three left bars. This is 187 out of the 218 solutions that I, I looked at as part of this data. Now let's look at the percentage of those students who are using some built-in or higher order function as part of their solution. And now we see that's really highly correlated. Again, not surprising. You're talking in terms of take whiles and filters. If you start using those operations, it's going to affect how you structure your code. We, we know that. But again, this is the first study to, to try to look at this. So this is particularly true in clean first. Length of a list is obviously a really popular thing to do. And once you're gonna use a built-in length operator, you're not writing a single loop solution anymore. Right? You're immediately out of that if you think to use a built-in length operator. We had a handful of students who used filter. They had to write a manual take while. The other students wrote a take while plus filter combination function manually. And then for summing, these students were using fold. Okay, so they're using the standard higher order operators. Now here's what we don't know from seeing this. 
What's the chicken and what's the egg? Are students saying, oh, cleaning the data is a good approach to this sort of problem, and that's something you use filter for? So they picked the, the style of program and then went to the construct. Or maybe it went the other way around. They might look at this and say, this sounds like filter. Filter was on the last homework. Maybe I can make this problem work as a filter problem, and that's how they got to clean first. We don't know that at this point, at least at this point in the talk. Which one of these is, is driving what students are doing? We just know that this is the pattern we're seeing. OK, so so far, we've seen the conclusion that when the students were in bracket, functional programming, whatever, they produced more diverse solutions and made fewer errors than historically with studies in this. And we see that certain constructs or structures in the language, or sorry, certain program structures are correlating with the use of certain built-ins. OK, that's what we know. What we don't know at this point in the talk, what's driving the choices of structure? What criteria are students using to decide which structure to use, if any? And what's going on with the students who make no progress? OK? Questions at this point? Yeah? In terms of the context of the course, could it be that the, this wakeboard problem is more similar to a similar problem they have during the course than what when you have hey, what's your name, real name, you know, like in print? Good. So the, the obvious question is, have they seen a program like this before? And maybe that's explaining why they're doing well on it. Wait a slide. <laughs> Great question. Wait a slide. OK? Any other questions at this point? You said that obviously the freshman was more at the beginning of the year or the end of the year? Uh, so this was more or less two thirds of the way through the course. So beyond the midterm for everybody, it kind of depended when each person could slot it into their assignment structure. But it was at least past midterm for everybody. OK? Yeah. Um, what if you ask this question like day one of the class, and then like later on ask them to actually do it? OK, what if you ask this day one in the class and later on ask them to do it? A lot of them would drop. <laughs> Some would report you to the department head for cruel and unusual punishment. But I get your point that we'd like to see how they're evolving with it. Um, and one of the things I'm going to talk about a little later is we've started doing some of these studies where we ask them questions in the first course, and then we do similar problems in the second course and see how it's changing when they have enough programming experience to actually approach these. So I'll get to some of that data. Yeah. Were they able and or encouraged to write tests? <laughs> <laughs> Were they able and or encouraged to write tests? The how to design programs curriculum is really big on testing, OK? We teach everybody that they need to write tests before they have to write any code. We all grade them on tests. And they are used to having a good 25 to 30 percent of their homework grade based on tests. Did they write tests? Often not, <laughs> OK? But some of them did. Um, and we did analyze the tests. We didn't find a lot that was really useful in them for that purpose. Now, some of these students were doing this on an exam where they had not been asked to produce the test, so they had, had reasons for it. But yes, it's, it's a great question, and that's something that our group looks at, is kind of what's the role of testing in all this. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, do you think that teaching comparative programming as an intercourse, do you think that's unethical? <laughs> Do I think it's unethical to teach imperative programming at the beginning? And we said this is being recorded, right? Uh, <laughs> let's just say it's not how I prefer to do things. And we can come back to that kind of question at the end when we've seen the rest of the, the, the content here, OK? Um, but it's definitely a perspective. OK. Let's get to the first question, OK? Broadening the collection of problems. Maybe we got lucky. OK? Everybody's been computing averages since high school. They should know the formula by now. There's not much to figure out. Maybe that had something to do with the problems. So what we're going to do now is try to extend the set of questions beyond rainfall and see what happens. Now, the classic problems like rainfall, when they were originally framed, they're framed in the early 80s, when mostly what you were teaching students in programming courses was keyboard I.O. So the rainfall solutions at that point were you know, read a number from input, do your checks, while back, read another number from input. This isn't really how we teach programming. Well, how we want to be teaching programming now. There are still places that do. But in a modern context, we're much more likely to be thinking about noisy data, unstructured data, streaming data, files, websites. Those kinds of things are more what we should be preparing students to do 
So we wanted problems that were like rainfall and having lots of tasks, but that involved more modern issues, cleaning data, parsing data, iteration, and we wanted things that would make sense to people in a variety of programming languages. Rainfall at least seems reasonable, regardless of what programming language you're coming out of. There are other problems that are often used, like ASCII to integer, which probably most of us who teach functionally don't really include that problem, but it's pretty common in, in imperative settings. So we wanted problems that instructors from kind of both sides of the aisle could agree were reasonable to have presented in their courses. So here's the set of problems we came up with for this next round. We kept rainfall because we had some baseline data to work with. We added palindrome. We had a problem called shopping cart, where you had a, a list of items and you had to compute the total cost of the items, but there were different kinds of discounts, right? So this week we're having a discount on shoes and that week we're having a discount on hats. Apply different discounts to the list. We had a problem called adding machine where you got a whole stream of data where you would have double zeros, consecutive zeros, separating sublists that you cared about, and you wanted to produce the sums of the sublists. I'll show you an example of that problem a little later. We had a problem where you've given a list of strings and you want to know what's the longest concatenation of three consecutive strings in there. And we had one where we wanted you to sum the largest item from each row of a table. Okay, this is what our team of experts from functional imperative teaching agreed on was a set of reasonable problems. And what we liked about them is they have some similar elements on the, in the two columns. So for example, the ideas of ignoring and skipping are in both rainfall and palindrome. And this is why palindrome makes the cut here. The idea of truncating comes up in two of the problems. The sentinel idea is, is interesting to contrast. Looking at windows of your data, Okay, maybe they're fixed length windows or delimiter separated windows, but the idea that your data is coming in windows is something we want to look at. Again, looking at patterns of consecutive elements, maybe looking at lists or sublists. These were the things that we had on both sides. And then we had this general separations of concerns idea, which you often hear about, talked about in, in programming contexts. And so these are the kinds of things we're looking at. Now what we're going to do in this next round of studies, students are going to write solutions for the programs on the left column. Okay, we're just going to give them the problems and say write your solutions. For the right column, we are going to give them two to three solutions to each of these problems written in different styles and ask them to give us a preference ranking with justification. Okay, so roughly we show them the standard imperative single loop, and some functional style solution, written in whatever programming language they're using. So they don't have to deal with the problem of not knowing languages, but we're curious what criteria they are using to reflect on these, on these programs. This study we did across countries. So we had four courses, two functional and two imperative, one of each from the US and, and Europe, and all four gave both columns of these problems as a homework assignment. Okay, so other than translating the questions into the programming language being used and whatever style conventions, everybody gets the same assignment across these, these institutions. And what we're curious about is how does the structure of code produced differ with the programming languages or the structure of what they preferred? And we were really interested in single traversal bias. We figured that the students who'd been taught a very conventional imperative approach would by and large say, you do things with single loops. Right? That's what we were expecting to see. We were also interested in, in just for ourselves knowing, is this set of six problems good for getting at these kinds of issues? Because we want to do more studies with them. Right? So we're, we're looking at both of those. All right, here's what we find. No surprise. Imperative programmers preferred single traversals. Okay, when we look at the problems, they ask them to rank what kind of solution they got. This is the percentage of students who preferred the single traversal solution on each of these problems for which we gave them the solutions. So for the imperative students, so the worst we get is 78% preferring that for the shopping cart problem. 
as opposed to a solution that had a separate loop for the hats discount, a separate loop for the shoes discount, whatever it was. Okay? The functional programmers can't agree with one another. <laughs> I think there might be a bigger point in there. Each course has a strong preference for, a, for single loops in one of these. Um, OK, there, there it is. We, we don't know why. By the way, we, we can't explain that. That's just what, what we saw in the data. Yeah. Uh, so we would have had about, let's see, the USA imperative class, I think, was 250 students. The USA functional class was 150. I think it was 100 in the European imperative class and about 30 in the European functional class. So, yeah. Okay, now what do they talk, I'm sorry, your question? Um, what country is GM? Germany. Germany. Yes, um, so Germany and France and then the two USA courses. These just happened to be the colleagues who wrote back to us first when we said, hey, can we use your students as guinea pigs? Um, any other questions? No, I, I think, um, so the, the two classes in the U.S. that we used were at the same institution, and the imperative course is taught by a legend. He's been at the university 50 years, and everybody says you have to take a course from this guy. So, I mean, there's, there's various factors influencing which students, course students go to, but those are both, the, the two U.S. courses were both at Brown, actually. They were our intro sequences. There's no difference in how they lead into the major. It's just if you want to come in and do Java first, you go to the imperative class. If you want to come in and start with functional, you go to the functional class, which then leads into Java later. So I'm sure there's some correlating sub-variables among those students, but part of the reason that the imperative class is so much bigger is it is kind of a legendary course on campus, so. Yes. USA 2. USA 2 was a, there was a one class in the US that couldn't do the programming problems but was able to do the ranking problems. So they were a little outlier group that just gave us ranking data. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is interesting is um, like what are the biases in how <laughs> programs are evaluated that lead to why one, why, why one group prefers one over the other? Um, and and like one of the and like the, the single traversal solution, for example, is very efficient, um, but it, it sort of decomposes very poorly. The functional programmers, you know, would you would imagine are biased more towards composition, but they're often getting the efficiency anyway because of lazy structures. So it's like it's almost looking at a different level. So it's like it's like almost you're asking the question to these two groups and they're hearing a different question. And that has to be, that bias has to be built into how the data is valued. Right, now, I will say that the lazy structures issue is not coming up for these students because they're not being taught that. I mean, maybe a couple of them happen to know it from reading on their own, but that is not part of the courses. As far as they are concerned, a recursive traversal is a potentially linear time operation depending on what computation you're doing. So that's, that is what they know of in terms of the, the runtime here, okay? Let's see what they actually talked about. Not surprisingly, efficiency is the number one concern that students raise. Now, they don't always raise it as, this is why I chose this solution. Sometimes when we look at the students' comments, you see people saying, even though this is not as efficient, I like it because. The point is, what topics or concerns do they even think to think about when evaluating these, these solutions? So efficiency is the biggest. Readability is the second. Now, what do they mean by efficiency? They express it in a lot of ways. Some of them talk about lines of code as if it were a meaningful measure of efficiency. That's not uncommon in students in a first programming course. Uh, some of them talk about space efficiency. They really don't like creating extra lists as intermediate data. Similarly, they'll talk about unnecessary data structures. They are dealing with 10 line lists, but you know maybe they're working on very old machines where this matters. But they've somehow been trained to think about the space of unnecessary data structures as something they should be concerned about. Readability comes up in talking about code organization. They will make various claims, some of them that you know, 
are more factual and some that are more personal preference. Uh, but they do talk about the organization of code. Some of them get into bigger issues, like separation of concerns, how maintainable this is, especially on the shopping cart problem. Some of them would say, what happens if next week we had a discount on something? Which of these programs will be more maintainable? We did have a couple of students say I, they voted against a solution because it was wrong, even though it said in big letters at the top of the handout that all these solutions are correct. Um, and we had some students who complained about the use of variables, either feeling that there should have been more or there should have been fewer. And that's just an issue that they're thinking about. Now, what we found particularly interesting about the efficiency comment is that the professor of the imperative class in the US, which was this group of 250 odd students, they didn't talk about efficiency, other than to tell his students, don't worry about it, right? I care about you getting code that runs. Don't worry about how fast it is. And yet, this is what students are thinking about. Yes? Uh, one of the courses was for people who had already programmed. Is it possible that some students who had prior experience, like in high school, had already kind of absorbed this idea that they had to be efficient, and so even when they were told to ignore it, they just ignored OK, so the, the course with those students was actually the first study. Oh, okay. the, the, there was not a separate course for that. That said, there were certainly students who had had high school programming in any of these populations, and some of them do come in having been taught things about efficiency. So we're not surprised that some of them are talking about it. Right? We're really looking at how it influences their decisions. And in the US functional class, they were being taught efficiency all the way through. That class integrates basic big O and data structures all the way through CS1. So there is not even presentation among the students in their background of efficiency, which is why this is more of a suggestive study than something we're drawing firm numeric data from. Yeah? Okay, here's your next exercise. Now let's think about palindrome, okay? We're doing a version of palindrome where you want to ignore capitals and you want to skip all the punctuation and white space. So you basically have three tasks here. You have to ignore the case, skip the punctuation, and somewhere do the equality check forward and backwards. So which of the ignoring case and skipping do you think students are going to do in the same traversal as the equality check versus in some kind of separate operator or separate passes? You've got functional students. You've got imperative students. Take a couple of seconds and, and think about what your predictions are here. All right, how many folks are expecting they're going to do all of these in one traversal? Some of them are going to do that. Some of them? Okay, who's going to do it? Who do you think is going to do that? The imperative students? You expecting they're going to put a pointer at each end of the string and just walk, walk in? That's what, the, that's what the study folks, which we all thought they were going to do. What else are you thinking? Yeah? Two. One to do the case and skipping punctuation, and then another for a person. OK, so you think you're going to do those two first and then, and then skip it? Yeah? I, I think they would draw punctuation first and then do the ignore the case and the rest of the row. And why do you think they're going to do that? Because the ignore the case doesn't change anything about the structure of the row. Yeah. OK, so it just seems easy? OK, any other predictions? Let's see what they did. All right. <laughs> The only people doing this in a single pass are the French functional programmers. <laughs> Yay. OK. <laughs> Nearly everybody is removing punctuation and downcasing before the equality check. OK? Almost nobody is doing the, the two pointers and, and walk in. And the largest percentage of folks who are combining all these are the US functional programmers. Right? We were baffled by this. And then we started really looking at the code. Right? I mean, everybody's programming functionally. This is cool. Well, they're all using library functions. <laughs> That's why these results come out this way. The students in the, the two imperative courses, they were using Java or Python, and they all knew a replace all like construct, and they used it. And that seemed to drive the structure of what they were doing. So these single traversals are less common in the presence of libraries, which is a good thing. 
right? Libraries are good. We, we want to encourage students to be thinking this way. But now it starts to get funny that half of those who used replace all when writing palindrome criticized the number of traversals as the primary criterion in their ranking preferences. Okay, multiple traversals over data is bad, but I'm going to use replace all. <laughs> now, maybe they think all library calls are constant time. <laughs> that's, that's plausible. We don't know. Maybe, and, and one thing we would, uh, yeah, maybe they say efficiency because that's the word they know. Right? They're not actually thinking about efficiency compared to anything else. That's just they're supposed to say something that's on an assignment, so they say efficiency. That's highly plausible with first-year first students. We'd love to try the study. We never have. If we wrote the same solution, but replace all was a separate function where they could see the traversal, would they rate the solution differently? I would bet money they probably do. Right? And it, again, it's not surprising, but it means that they're thinking about something other than what they think they're thinking about. So, Sorry, it's not about functional programming. It's that when you use libraries and built-ins, you're getting more diverse structures and getting fewer errors. Right? And it's, that's a good thing. Um, students might not have accurate cost models. That's probably not surprising to anybody who's hired people before. But um, it's certainly something we see coming out in these studies. And they also they do know a lot of factors. They talk about efficiency, but they also are starting to get a sense of things like readability, maintainability, and these other things that they're, they're trying to think about. That's a good thing. We still don't understand what happens when there aren't any libraries, or when they have nothing to rely on, what would imperative versus functional students do on these problems. And we still have those students who didn't make any progress in the first place that we haven't talked about. I want to look at one more of these of these problems here. And this was the adding machine problem I alluded to briefly at the beginning. So an adding machine, you're getting in a list of numbers. And every time you hit a zero, you're going to view it as a break. And then you're going to sum up the sublist that occurs at between, each pair of between each set of consecutive zeros. But when you hit two zeros, you're done. Okay, This was a problem that was proposed to us by Mike Clancy, who's been a Longtime professor at Berkeley who studied these kinds of issues, um, again, looking at a lot at how people do in, in functional versus other, other programming styles. And so here the question is, given this problem, how are students going to try to write this code? Okay. Now, you give this to students who are working in Java, they're going to do one of these two kinds of for loops, most likely. Right? They'll either do the, the per element iterator style or they'll do an old-fashioned ii plus 1 kind of for loop, right? So this is what you'd expect from the imperative students, and this is indeed what you, you get. Now, each of these has pitfalls to them. Um, in the, if you're using the iterator style loops, well, you need an additional variable to track whether you've already seen a 0. Right? You can't easily get to consecutive elements with that style of iterator. And that's a pitfall that students don't necessarily predict when they first start writing this code. They kind of run into that problem sooner or later. The problem we most likely see with this version is they abuse i. Right? They confuse the index for the number at the index. So we get a lot of solutions that are summing the indices in those positions. It's the same problem that professional, early stage professional programmers probably make too. You sometimes slip, which is why we tell students to use the iterator loops in the first place. But then you get to these certain patterns where which construct you're using matters. Okay. What do the functional folks do on this problem? Recursion and pattern matching. They get a huge boost in this problem over the two looping groups. Because they have the power to change the input list. They can recur through. Sum for the first two elements, put them back on the list, and keeps going. Okay? I've left a lot of the detail out here. Right? I didn't put the code in for checking for consecutive zeros and whatnot. The point is the power to modify the list on the recursion is something that the students really draw on when working on this problem. And the functional students 
make, very few, make far, far fewer errors on this problem than imperative students because of how much they have access to. They have easy access to this element and the next one for doing the zero comparison, and they get to play with the list as they go and use it kind of as temporary storage, almost. And we see them exploiting that, that value a lot when they, when they do this. All right, so what's the punchline of all this? Programming languages have standard idioms. You know, we're people who program in multiple paradigms. We, we know this. Some of these idioms can be, do you create intermediate data? If you program functionally, you're comfortable with this idea. If you are mostly been trained on for loops, it's not obvious. And if what you're doing is manually sized arrays, it's not even easy. Right? It depends what you've been taught. Do you tend to write really small functions? I think that's something functional courses tend to do, is we teach students to write very small, very tight functions and write a lot of them. They can be really good for, for testing. And some languages have better testing infrastructure than others that encourages you to write this way. There's also the question of whether you have easy to use iterators in your language. So all of these different idioms that we're teaching students play into how they structure their code to these problems. And students are going to adapt the patterns they know, both in terms of the language they're using and the pedagogy they've been taught. They've been shown patterns of writing code. They're going to pick those up, plop them down, and try to adapt them to whatever new problem you've given them. This is what cognitive science literature tells us, if you look at the cognition of programming literature. It all is based on the patterns you've been learning. Now, if it's all based on patterns, and patterns get you into trouble, we have to ask, should pattern matching be considered harmful? No, not your kind of pattern matching. That, that's good, right? But this idea of always matching on patterns of prior programming, that can seem to get students really, really stuck. And we've started doing now more talk aloud interview studies, where we watch line by line what the students are doing as they work on some of these problems. And we see this all the time. They say, this sounds like the such and such problem. And they start kind of copying that code down, and they try to modify it. So for example, the students who've learned functional out of how to design programs, they've been taught a pattern that says, if you're processing a recursively defined data type, you're going to make a recursive call on the rest of the list. This is what we teach in the, the how to design programs curriculum. Because for most of the programs you write in the first two thirds of the curriculum, this actually is the traversal pattern you want until you can start getting into more complicated kinds of recursion that breaks that, that rule of what data you're recurring over. But students who get this far and write that much pattern down, they forget that they can change parts of this. And they spend all their time trying to add code around it instead of realizing that maybe different parameters or additional parameters would solve the whole problem. So this is something we're exploring, is, is the amount of code that they write down leading them to struggle more? And is that telling us something about how we teach with these kinds of patterns? So what we've added to our knowledge here is that it's the constructs they know that drive the structure of their code. They're not sitting there planning and saying, oh, this is like cleaning, so I should clean the data first. That's what we get to do when we're experts. First year students are not there yet. They hit that point somewhere during college, but they're most of them. But they're not there. I don't know, I'll let the recruiters in the audience answer that. But, but they're not there at CS1, and they're not expected to be by what we know from cognitive science. And we still don't know how to teach around this. right? This is still a big open question. So for example, if the library functions are driving their structure, how do we teach them how to fill in around a library? I was never taught that. I was just kind of, this stuff was there, and you kind of used it, and some people got it, and some people didn't. But this is something we should be explicitly teaching students. If you're going to live in a world with rich libraries, how do they decompose problems around the library functions? We should be teaching that to them. If they start with something like the iterator for loop, and they realize they need extra variables, how do we teach them to give up and backtrack instead of trying to smash on their current code until it works? That's something, again, we have to teach them explicitly because they don't do it by instinct. The early studies on this work from the 1980s into the, into the early 2000s, they all talked about composing code. They never talked about decomposing problems. 
And I think these are deeply connected issues. When you're programming in terms of libraries or higher order functions, you're thinking in terms of decomposing problems. That's not a vocabulary that a lot of students are coming in with or learning. And that might be part of the problem here. There was a question before about testing. Yes, this is something we're also looking for. What is the role that tests play in, in driving all of this? Um, so let me kind of wrap this up. So what we're currently experimenting with is we have students write multiple solutions with different structures. So I mentioned I'm teaching my first scholar course this semester. So I'm teaching a course where the students did an intro course in Racket and OCaml, purely functional. In my course, we did the first half in Java. And then at the midterm, we switched to Scala. So now they have the functional style they knew from the first course plus the imperative style from Java. And the first assignment we gave them when they got Scala is write this assignment, the same code twice. Once using the Scala parts of Scala, and once, or the functional parts of Scala, and once using only the imperative parts. So they have to start to think about the different ways of structuring code to the same problem. We've got some data from, a, from an experiment last year. We actually start contrasting what students do on their solutions to these. And we find that the students who come out of the functional programming course, I'm sorry, students who are in a functional programming course, are able to do two different structures of solutions much more readily than students who are in a Java-based OO course after having finished a functional course. So once their mindset is in Java, they seem to forget what, what they think they could have done in the first course. These are two different populations of students. We have yet to do this study with the same group of students across the two courses. But this is the kind of things that we're, we're thinking about. There's a lot of confounding variables. But there's something really cool going on here. And I think that languages like Scala are great for exploring this because you can turn on and off the feature set that students are allowed to use. So how do we continue this kind of work? We've got to start embracing libraries when we study how students learn to program. There are very few papers that ever consider that libraries exist. Not everybody's learning how to write arrays and for loops. Um, we designed, it was, it was kind of interesting, when we set up those six problems I showed you, we were thinking about the cleaning subtask for palindrome. It never occurred to us that strings were interesting to have in there because they had a replace all data type, right? And again, it came down to the libraries. We have to emphasize decomposition as much as composition. We have to talk about that. Um, and it's also important to realize all of this can be language agnostic, right? We don't. Although some languages are taught with libraries more than others, we're not taking a claim in the functional versus non-functional war. We're simply saying that there are ways in which the functional programmers tend to teach that seem to be leading students to have more flexibility in these first courses. And there's a whole lot of questions about cost models, which we will come back to at some point. Now, when I give this talk, there's some frequently asked questions I get. Um, first of all, is any of this relevant I mean, planning and composition and decomposition, is this really matter for students in their first programming course? Or if you're paying attention nationally to this idea of CS for all, right, computer science for all K-12 students, who actually needs this? Because, you know, higher order functions, that's that advanced college stuff. No, no, no. More than ever, this stuff is going to have to be going into pre-college. Why? Because we're talking seriously about teaching things like basic scripting and data science. We are not talking about teaching everybody how to write for loops, right? We want students to come out of high school with some basic abilities to do realistic processing of simple examples. And the kinds of constructs and libraries we use in functional programming are really good for that. So this is a good time for this conversation to be having. My favorite uh, paper review comment from this work was palindrome. Are you kidding? followed by a bunch of things that I can't repeat on a recorded video, but they actually were in the review. Um, string manipulation remains a useful kind of skill for students to know how to do. So yes, palindrome may have a certain 70s appeal to it, and we're happy to consider other problems, but it really did work for these settings because it's, it's doing manipulations that we think students are seeing in other settings. And everybody always asks this in Q&A, programming language wins. No, wrong question. 
It really is about the libraries and the constructs and how we're choosing to teach them. Okay? Now, I was going to, this was where I originally was going to close out the talk, and so I started talking to a couple people before I came up here today. And I want to throw in just two last slides for those of you who might be thinking about K-12, maybe because you have kids in school and teachers are asking you, it's worth knowing there are some of us who are doing functional programming in K-12. Okay? Um, and specifically, I'm co-director, this different hat, I'm co-director of a project called Bootstrap, where we are a national outreach program that creates modules that embed early programming into existing school subjects. So we have a module that does introductory computer science in an algebra class, in a physics class, as a data science module inside a statistics or business class. And they're all done in functional programming. Okay? And that's kind of the gist of it, just to give you a one, one slide taste of what we're doing with the students in the algebra class, the students think they're writing a video game. Okay? I mean, they are writing a video game, but they think that's the point. Whereas what we're actually doing them is teaching algebra. So if you look at a video game as a sequence of still frames, how would you describe this, write a program for this? Well, we have a bee flying across the screen, and it's trying to hit the balloon so it can pop. Okay, that's the, the program the kids are trying to write. So we teach them to write a straight up linear function that computes the new position of the balloon from the position in the previous frame. Okay? So if you do this in something like Scratch, which is the K-12 language du jour, you would be writing some kind of loop, repeat loop, that keeps moving the, the B along. We instead say, no, you're thinking about a function that describes movement from frame to frame. Yeah, difference equations, but we don't say that to the, to the K-12 students. But this is what we have them write. And when they want the B to move in response to pushing uh, keys on the keyboard, well, that's what the math teachers call a piecewise function, and it's what programmers call a conditional. So the entire game design project is a series of exercises where we say to the students, you would like your video game to do this now, wouldn't you? Well, here's the math concept you need to know to do it, and here's the kind of function you write to get there. And we teach them how to do composition in the Pythagorean theorem, again, functional programming to do de collision detection for example. So the point is when setting it up this way, we're aligned to math standards all over the, the country for this, this kind of work. You can go into various classes, and if anybody's interested in this particular issue and wants to ask me about it later, I'm happy to, to talk about it. I said we're, we're deployed nationwide, 25,000 students a year going through this, this curriculum, so we're pretty mature. And again, it's all driven by functional programming. So with that, I'm happy to take any other questions you have. generally in terms of like when people are taking a first course in computer science between imperative and functional? I would, so first of all, when you say first course, do you mean first course collegiate, first course K-12? So right now when you look at the surveys, what you see is it, it was Java, which meant imperative sometimes with objects. I mean, a lot of people were using Java as the vehicle but they weren't really teaching objects. They were just teaching imperative in a main method. Java is starting to wane, and Python is taking over. Now, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, but, but the hope is Python can mean many things, right? Python is a language that can be taught in a lot of different ways. So while I imagine many people are doing fairly imperative Python, there are people who are certainly doing Python with list comprehensions and things like that. So the tide is turning towards Python, I think, there are still a lot of places that are working in Java. And this is where you actually have a pretty tight dance between the AP program. So if you're based in the US, AP is the advanced placement system where students can, they presume they take a course in high school that's supposedly valid for college credit. They take a test at the end, and many schools will give them credit for that. Because of that arrangement of college credit, there are many places where the high schools and the colleges stay synced on what they teach in intro so that students can be getting that credit. So as long as the AP is staying in Java, that's going to drive 
many places to stay with, with Java. There's always been a set of functional diehards. There will continue to be a set of functional diehards. Um, but functional, I get many more students coming into my intro courses who think Haskell is cool, who have hung out on Lambda the Ultimate, and you know, who have a sense of functional programming. It's really interesting. It is growing. That it used to be like, what's that weird stuff you're doing? And now it's, oh, I need to know this, don't I? So it, it's, it's shifting. There's hope. Yes? Video games, uh, it seems like you're able to describe maybe fairly abstract and advanced mathematics through famili familiar ways, like yeah. having a bee and a balloon across the screen. Um, have you been able, have you seen that you're able to teach younger children than what normally would be taught algebra because of that? Right, so can we teach younger students algebra? So we don't have large enough data samples for me to give you kind of a, a math, a, a, quantitative answer to that. But we do certainly have a lot of schools that have used this in seventh grade as a pre-algebra kind of class, and students are working with functions just fine. Places that have tried it for sixth graders, the function material goes over their heads a bit. But the other thing we do as part of this curriculum is we spend a lot of time just composing images. So we have an exercise where we tell students to pick a flag and build it by composing operations on images like you know overlay and crop and rotate and filter and that also is building up a discipline of algebraic expressionness and that's something that fifth and sixth grade students do just fine so it seems to be that barrier of introducing functional function abstraction which seems to work best once we get to seventh and we've had people do it with very gifted in fifth but mainstream seventh seems to be about where that's coming in at the moment. But the data science curriculum we do does not rely on functions. The data science curriculum we do, tables are a built-in data structure. And so there's a whole bunch of higher order operators in the language, you know, filter rows, extract columns. So the students are doing kind of higher order functional programming, but without ever seeing the functions explicit over data they pull in from Google Sheets. And that's kind of how that curriculum gets them into some of those concepts. And we think that's going to work with, with younger students. Yes. You made the point that it seems like uh, <coughs> introductory students have a hard time kind of filling in between the functions they know. Like if they have library functions to do exactly what they want, they're great. As soon as it's not quite what they want, they kind of struggle. Yeah. Um, do any courses work on having students actually kind of implement some of these library functions? Like they get, they're given the library and they kind of try and do it themselves and learn how it's implemented. It seems like maybe what's going on is that they don't, they're not confident they could do it themselves, so they don't want to try and like do something similar because they're like maybe not going to get it right. Right, and I think this is going to vary hugely from course to course. So the courses I teach, they have to implement them before they get the library functions, right? So once they've actually shown they can build it, we say, oh, by the way, that one's built in, right? Um, but you know, there are other places that, that don't do that. It really depends on the goals of your class, and you know, CS is such a broad interpretive space of what we're trying to get students to do that there's a lot of variation there. Follow-ups planned for seeing how well these students do in maybe STEM fields in college or graduate. Of so, are you talking about the from the language studies or from this K-12 curriculum? From the K-12. We would love to do that. Unfortunately, that requires a certain degree of cooperation from school districts, in, uh, institutional review board applications, and a whole bunch of paperwork. And to get that actually work, you've got to have a partner at the district level that believes in this enough and wants to take the time to really help you navigate those logistics. So we would love to be doing that. We think we're on the verge of that kind of partnership in, in two places. We have a, a major US city and a state where we've gotten an enthusiastic adopter at the state level. So we might start doing some of that work. But we've had to go, we've been in existence with this program for 10 years and we've had to do a lot of just building up the basic results of effectiveness and everything before you get to this point. So hopefully in five or six years, we can tell you a story on that. Yeah. Um, I've seen you guys been working with the computing at school group in the UK. <laughs> so um, we are uh, well aware of what they, they do. We have reached out to them, um, but they had their own curricular plans. So we don't work with them, but we have occasionally given presentations on what we do to some of the folks there. Um, we've just been adopted for a pilot in Sweden. Uh, so they're going to be rolling out um, in one of their teacher prep programs. They're going to be rolling this out as the curriculum that goes into the pre-service teacher program in one of the, the Swedish districts. We found that out a couple weeks ago. Um, 
Anybody wants to ask anything else, I'll be around. I'm happy to chat further with people. Thanks a lot.